Good evening and welcome to Colorado Decides, a joint production of PBS 12, CBS 4, and the Colorado Sun. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for joining us. Joining me is John Frank from the Colorado Sun and political analyst Eric Sonderman. We continue our look at the major initiatives on November's ballot. Tonight's debate will examine both sides of Amendment B, the ballot issue that would repeal the Gallagher Amendment from the Colorado Constitution. Joining us for the next 30 minutes are Colorado State Representative Denea Esgar in support of the measure, and Michael Fields, Executive Director of Colorado Rising State Action, opposing the measure. Okay, we have limited time, so let's get right to it. John, why don't you ask our first question? Very good. Representative Escar, let's start with you. Gallagher is an integral part of our fiscal picture, as you know, <laughs> being on the Budget Committee, but it's not easily understood. So let's talk about what is Gallagher and why do you think it needs to be repealed? Sure. Uh, you know, Gallagher is a 40-year-old formula that sits within our state constitution that is outdated and is no longer operating under the function that it was intended to. Um, remember, Gallagher passed before Tabor happened. And Gallagher was really intended to make sure that we were protecting property tax rates um, for residential, um, Colorado, rep, sorry, residential property tax rates. And it, it was supposed to make sure that there wasn't an unequal balance of where our property tax rates were coming from, whether it was residential or non-residential. And it had always intended to be able to maintain this rate that would keep that ratio at 45-55 split. Whereas now, because of Tabor, anytime that rate has gone down on the residential side, we've never been able to adjust back up even when we should have. So originally, when Gallagher passed, um, the residential rate was sitting at somewhere around 20, 25-30%. Today it sits at 7.1% and there's a possibility um, this coming next year that it's actually going to fall below 6% and we'll never be able to go back up. Um, the reason we're asking to repeal it is it's, it's really an unfair equation when we talk about the non-residential rate that stays at 29% no matter what. Michael, 45% residential, 55% business and, and other taxes. Why do we need to keep this? Why is this so important to Colorado? Well, one, I think that uh, it's helped keep uh, pr property taxes low in our state. Uh, we do have some of the, the lower uh, property taxes, residential side uh, in the nation, and I think that's a good thing. I think we should in encourage home ownership. I think, uh, you know, you look at how much costs have gone up for our houses uh, and, and in apartments especially. Uh, we're in the middle of a recession, uh, taking away that. And really what this would do is if you repeal Gallagher, our, our residential property taxes will be higher. Um, and given that fact, uh, I think this is a bad time to do it. I think there are some adjustments that need to be made to Gallagher. Uh, but I think these, this full repeal, this is a problem that is only uh, in certain parts of our state. Uh, where I live and where most people live on the, on the front range in Colorado, this is not a problem. Uh, you know, and, and revenue is going up and up uh, every time. And so uh, looking at this, we should deal with it where it needs to be dealt with, not uh, change and increase property taxes for everybody. And just to be clear, property taxes aren't going to increase exactly. they will be, they will be this higher. repeal, but they could, local leaders could down the line. That's what you're no, saying. No, I'm saying that uh, the assessment rate will be 7.15% if it is repealed. If they are not, it will be 5.88%. So we will be paying more more in property taxes if it is repealed. So the way we see it, honestly, is that we are keeping things frozen exactly the way it is. If, if the repeal passes, if Amendment B passes, we ran a, a bill as well to go along with that, Senate Bill 223 last year that passed as well, to make sure that when Amendment B passes, that the assessment rate will actually freeze exactly where it is now. So there will not be a change from what we're paying today. And how long is that freeze? That freeze is, uh, so I believe it's several years. I'd have to look back at the bill at the exact date. But the intention was that we would freeze that there and then go back and look. Anytime we wanted to increase it, because of Tabor, we would still have to go back to the vote of the people to ask for that increase. We're simply saying, let's stop the drop, let's hold it where it is, and let's move forward with figuring this out. Eric, your turn to get involved. Sure, let me start with just personal experience here, and I'll address this to Michael, and then we'll go to Representative Escar. Until recently, I owned a house in central Denver and an office building about a mile away that within a tiny fraction or a tiny increment were worth the same. If I'd put them on the market, mm -hmm. they would have been worth the same price. Mm -hmm. Yet I was paying four and a half times as much in property tax on that office building as I was on that house. What kind of fiscal sense does that make in the big picture and why are we defending that formula? 
Yeah, I would say that you're right, that there is a, it is uh, tilted against commercial property. There's no doubt about that. Um, what this doesn't do, though, is change that, right? So repealing it, it still stays at 29% uh, assessment rate at this point. There was no talk about lowering that assessment rate uh, for the, on the commercial side. That is not in the proposal. Uh, and so I don't think it really gets to, to that problem. Um, you're right, we do have low property taxes, as I mentioned, on the residential side. On the commercial side, you were in Denver. Uh, it's about middle of the pack in the country. Uh, it's still high compared to our residential. Uh, and I think it needs to be looked at. This is one of the problems that I have is there's uncertainty on what will happen on the business side once this is repealed. Will legislators uh, you know, want to go to the people and, and raise commercial property taxes? Will they want to lower them? I have no idea. Uh, but I, I think they need to be clear about that before they're talking about any kind of repeal. And to Representative Esgar, I mean, you mm -hmm. can comment on that. But isn't it inevitable that over some period of time, and probably not that many years, that if this passes, if it is repealed, Gallagher is repealed, that residential property taxes will substantially increase? Isn't that part of the bargain? The only way residential uh, property taxes are going to increase is if the value of your home increases. That's exactly how it is right now. What I want to make sure that we understand is that 20% of the tax base that we're talking about is paying over 50% right now, 55% of the tax. Um, we want to talk about this is non-residential that's paying the 29%. This is small businesses. When we talk about COVID, times of COVID, right now they are being hit the hardest. And when we talk about this uh, property tax, they want to know why right now they're paying four times what a residential property tax rate is. If we don't pass Amendment B and the residential assessment rate falls, that number goes up to five times the amount in a time when we're working our hardest to make sure small businesses not only come back, but they are able to thrive. But this doesn't do anything to lower the commercial side. This makes sure that we freeze everything the way it is right now so we can work on the ratio that is out of balance right now. We've got, you know, right now it's an 80-20 split instead of a 45-55 split. John, let's get you back involved. Yeah. One of the things to understand about Gallagher is it's statewide, and it yeah. creates a lot of inequality in Colorado because different areas of the state uh, address property taxes in different ways. So in this environment, you know, is it good public policy for tax rates in Durango to be dictated by home prices in Denver or oil and gas prices in Weld County? Michael, we'll start with you. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that a, uh, a solution needs to be more regional based or county based. Uh, there was a committee that the, the legislature went through different options. One of the options was making the assessment rate more regional. I think that makes a whole lot more sense because there are areas of our state that have either less commercial property or their values aren't going up as much. And so when the cut happens, local services are hurt. But this is a specific part of our state. Um, you know, the legislature came and it's just going to smash through the whole thing in order to, to, to not fix the problem, I think. And so looking at it, I totally agree that there needs to be adjustments to this. I would like to see a different approach. Um, but when it comes down to it, overall, our property tax revenue for our state goes up every year. It went up 15% last year. Even during the recession, it's going to go up 10% this year. Uh, this is not a overall problem. It is a regional problem. It should have a regional solution. Representative Vascar, mm -hmm. that raises a, a good question. Will... Um, the inequality in Colorado be addressed by this? And how quickly will we see this fixed? Sure. So I appreciate you mentioning that um, committee. I was actually the chair of that committee in the summer of 2018, and it was uh, a bipartisan committee, and we actually agreed to a whole bunch of different ideas that came out, eventually didn't make it to the full uh, General Assembly. But one of those was repealing Gallagher, but also the regional approach as well. What we're saying right now is pass Amendment B. Let's take it out of the Constitution. We already have the freeze in place because Senate Bill 223 passed and was signed by the governor. That gives us time and space to make sure that we are coming up with solutions that actually work. A lot of us were on board with the regional idea because we know there are areas that are facing deeper cuts, harder cuts because of the growth that's happening here in Denver, and that's unfair. But then the question came, how do you define regions? There's a lot to dissect. There's a lot to dig into. I know there's a lot of legislators and people outside of the legislature who really want to dig in and make this fair and make it work. But in the meantime, in the middle of this economic downturn, in the middle of this free fall that we have right now happening, we have to stop the bleeding. We have to make sure that we can freeze things where they are Make Amendment B pass. If Amendment B passes, that happens. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at some serious cuts, not only in our state budget, in our county's budgets, in our fire district's budgets, if we don't do something today in November. Let me jump into a quick question and more of a technical thing. I'll throw it to you, Dania. Um, we've seen a lot of local communities de-Bruce themselves. Mm -hmm. Is this something, can a community de-Gallagher themselves? Is, is there options there that we've heard from a, a variety of fire districts of mm -hmm. uh, 
are there local solutions if this does not pass? Absolutely. I mean, there's always the ability to go to your local voters and do this. That they're absolutely. But when we talk about fire districts who, if we don't pass Amendment B today, are going to have a drastic cut in their budgets as it is, asking them to pay for a campaign, pay for a ballot initiative, go and talk to their voters, explain to their voters why they need this. It's incredibly expensive. And we are have already put the chokehold on many of these different districts because of the rate falling in Gallagher that we can't really necessarily afford and expect them to be able to afford to go out and do this locally every time. Michael, it seems that is the answer to Tabor issues is, would your stance be that, th th that you actually should be asking if fire districts want to increase taxes, they, they should go through what uh, Danae just described? Yeah, there is an option for that. Obviously, uh, you can raise mills uh, in the area that does, uh, you know, go into that that uh, uneven formula. I agree with that. Uh, but I do think that it is, it is a high burden in some areas to say every time this happens, you need to go back and have a vote on that, which is why I support I would support a regional approach to this and say, you know what, um, this is something that and, and this is the, the problem we have is this is repeal this and then trust us that we'll come up with something or that we'll, we'll uh, you know, make a movement in order to make it better. And that initial bill that they have uh, makes it 29% and 7.515% and doesn't have a plan for a regional approach or making it more local. So I, I think the legislature needs to be much more transparent on what comes next before you're going to take away a protection uh, that is in our Constitution right now. Eric, I think uh, it's your turn. Sure. Let's, uh, I opened my mail yesterday and the, the blue book uh, was in the mail. So let's talk about the blue book a little bit. This issue particularly has gotten some attention and some heat over the last few weeks because it was the only one of the issues covered in the blue book, the 11 statewide ballot issues, where the Legislative Council changed, monkeyed around, some people might allege, with the language that went into the blue book from what the nonpartisan staff had drafted. Can each of you, maybe we'll start with Representative Esgar, explain what happened and in your case, maybe defend what happened sure. in terms of that language? Sure. You know, I don't serve on legislative councils, so I wasn't there that day to really fully understand it. It's a council of legislators. It's uh, bipartisan. We wanted to, the, what I was told is they wanted to make sure when they looked at the, the draft language for the Blue Book for Amendment B, they wanted to make sure that it was more clear. They wanted to simplify things so voters actually really understood. Gallagher is complicated. It's a complicated issue. It takes a lot of time and energy to really dig in and understand exactly what it is. When we're talking about a ballot initiative, people want to be able to look at it, understand it simply. What, my, what does my yes vote mean and what does my no vote mean? And that's what we did. And a district judge decided with us within 20 minutes to dismiss the case that was brought forward. Um, I think, you know, this is one of those where it's unprecedented move what, what they did. Uh, and basically, they weren't try nobody believes they were trying to make it more clear. They were trying to tip the scales in order to, mm -hmm. to really hide the fact that this would be increased property taxes compared uh, to if it was not repealed. And so what you had was you had, uh, you know, if you legislate a council, they go through months of work. They talk to both sides. They come up with this impartial, fair system. Uh, you're not always going to agree with it, but it is a, a fair system. Legislators within three minutes came in and said, we have a whole new... We're going to rewrite this whole thing. Uh, we're going to change the title. We're going to change the arguments on both sides and then uh, put it into the blue book without any discussion from anybody about that amendment. And so uh, in looking at that, and, and it's just, it is unprecedented. And the judge just said they didn't want to deal with it. They said they lacked jurisdiction. They didn't say that it was a proper way to do it. And I think this is something that I'm glad has gotten a lot of attention because legislators shouldn't be tipping the scale no matter what you think about an issue. Uh, they should let the legislative council do their job and come up with an impartial uh, blue book. The legislators on the Legislative Council actually did their job. That's what the council is there for to do, is go through the blue book. It's never been done before like this. They've never rewrote something like this. I just want to never remind happened. you all that it was bipartisan. The vote that happened was actually bipartisan, and we had Republicans and Democrats agree that the language should be changed. And I would say bipartisan doesn't mean that it's fair and impartial, right? These legislators are people who voted for this. Uh, now we're, we're tipping the scale uh, and sending this out to every voter in the state. John? Representative Vescar, I want to make sure you get a chance to respond to something Michael said a moment ago. He made the point, and this is true, the coronavirus certainly didn't cause this problem with the Gallagher Amendment. Mm -hmm. It's been around for decades. Right. And Gallagher, not COVID. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gallagher's been around for decades. And you talk about this legislation that will put a temporary freeze on the rates so we can figure out what to do. But the big question is, what comes next? And that unknown mm -hmm. could scare some voters. Uh, what can you do to assuage their fears? Can you commit sure. to take whatever solution back to the ballot? Is that something you'd be willing to do so voters get a ability to weigh in on the final verdict here? 
I don't think that's unfair to ask. I think it's a lot of uh, longer conversations that need to be had, not only with legislators. Um, again, this, to get this to the ballot this time, there was over 75 percent of the legislators in the General Assembly voted yes to do this because they knew it was a problem and an issue. That never happens. You, you report on the Capitol all the time. 75 percent of legislators agreeing on one thing ra very rarely happens. So there is the will of the legislature to actually start digging in and working and fixing this problem. But in the meantime, we cannot afford for that residential assessment rate to drop. And that's what happens if we don't pass Amendment B. So not only is there legislators who are working to come up with solutions, but there are people outside of the Capitol, people that truly understand, school districts who understand what this means to them, special districts across the state, fire districts across the state, water districts, metro districts, you name it. There are people who want to find a solution. And we're going to continue to work on those solutions and bring them forward. Michael, uh, a recent analysis we did at coloradosun.com found a majority of counties actually generate less residential property tax revenue than they did in 2009, you know, 11 years ago. Is this not a problem? And how should it be fixed if if repealing Gallagher is not the answer. Yeah, I think that same uh, you know, article that you guys wrote with the charts and everything else showed that uh, since uh, Gallagher passed that uh, adjusted for inflation, adjusted per capita, we are paying almost double the amount, even under Gallagher, uh, you know, for property taxes. And I think you have to look at this uh, when it comes to individuals, too. Right, that we are in the middle of a recession. Uh, I remember when I was a, a teacher, I was a fourth grade teacher, we, I made a little over $33,000 a year. When my rent would go up, it would be a big deal. You think about seniors who are on fixed incomes or Social Security, uh, if their housing value goes up, that's not money that's in their pocket um, to pay these taxes. And so I think we have to look at it uh, you know, at that individual level and say, yes, we do have a problem with certain localities. There are certain localities that are paying less, and, and we have to uh, adjust for that. And that's why I think a different plan would be smart. Uh, but a lot of people uh, live in areas where, ta where property taxes are going up. It is impacting them. Uh, and they'll still pay more even when the assessment rate drops. Uh, that has been the story since Gallagher that we're always paying more in property taxes. Again, just to clarify, Representative Escar, maybe you can speak to this. Not all seniors would be impacted because we also have another mechanism of the property tax <laughs> exemptions. I want to make, before yeah, we scare well, too many people. Also, that's not funded every year, right? There, there are several years, every other year, every third year, where senior homestead is not funded. But yes, there is a mechanism uh, to alleviate some of that. We do have the senior homestead exemption that is still um, in, in working the way it's supposed to, and it has been. We talked a little bit about the campaign, so I want to get to this issue. Uh, the proposed repeal has brought together bipartisan coalitions on both opposing and supporting sides. Um, why do you think that is, and does this make that, usually in the election season we see that this is brought out to bring out a certain base. This would probably bring out everybody on both sides. Michael, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you can call it pe peculiar bedfellows or whatever you like, or bipartisan. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect the campaigns? Why do you think that's happening? Well, I think it makes it much more interesting. Uh, you know, we have an issue where uh, there are uh, people on both sides of, of the aisle working together. I mean, when, you know, when, when uh, former Speaker Dickie Lee Hullinghorse was in the legislature, we disagreed a lot, but we agree on this. And I think uh, part of it is, you know, her statement about this could help hurt people in apartments or low income people if, if property taxes continue to go up, I think is a valid point. Uh, and even on the business side, that, that she's concerned that there's special interests that could get breaks over other ones. Uh, and I worry about that too. And so I think it is one of those interesting issues, uh, bipartisan on both sides. Um, and they see a different problem and a different solution. I think everybody sees that something needs to get done. It's just, uh, is a full repeal the right thing? And so it's been fun working with, with people that I don't normally work with. Danae, same question sure. to you. You know, I think it's been interesting, not only um, in 2018, when we had the committee put together, that it came out of our committee unanimously. That was equal Republicans and Democrats passed the state house this year, or the state legislature this year, by 75 percent of Republicans and Democrats agreeing. And when you look at the Denver Post is supporting this, rural organizations like Colorado Farm Bureau, Colorado Rural Schools Alliance, business groups like NFIB, Action 22, civic groups like the League of Women Voters and Children's Campaign, and statewide um, associations like EMS and special districts, all of these vested interests are all coming together to support something. To me, that tells me the time has come to fix this. The time has come to repeal Gallagher and vote for Amendment B. Well, time is going quickly here. We're towards the end of our debate. We still have a couple minutes before closing statements. But, uh, Eric, if you have a next question, maybe uh, some a uh, uh, little bit quicker answers since we only have about three minutes to the closing statements. Okay. I, th I think this will lend itself to quick answers. I'll start with Michael. But in a crisp message, what do you tell to business owners, commercial property owners who are out there watching this show of why 
they should continue indefinitely to pay a disproportionate share of the property tax burden. Yeah, I wouldn't tell them that they need to do that. I would just say that this doesn't address that. I would love to see a proposal that lowers, uh, you know, at least a couple points on the assessment rate on the commercial side. Um, I think, you know, the other side of it is they're also, all these business owners are homeowners too, and they all, uh, you know, have parents and kids and different stuff that, that own property. And so I think, uh, you know, knowing that this isn't really going to help you on the commercial side, uh, but it is going to be a harder burden on the residential side, I think is the case you make. And I have to talk to, to chambers and different business groups, uh, but I think they uh, are, are concerned about the lack of clarity to on what comes next. Um, it could be that, 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 proper, that business property taxes ended up going up if voters vote that way. So I think there is some concern uh, of the uncertainty. And as Representative Esgar, I think we've covered this ground, but I'll give it to you again. What do you say to homeowners out there mm -hmm. who have quite frankly benefited and done very well under Gallagher for the last 38 years mm -hmm. and it's provided them with some security and protection? Sure. How do you assure them that that security and protection is not going away? Sure. I, I would make sure they understand completely that we have the third lowest um, property taxes, tax rates in the country. This will keep that there. This will, this will freeze things the way they are right now, which is the third lowest in the country. We're not going to increase that. In fact, we can't increase that without a vote of the people. That's not what repealing uh, Gallagher is going to do. What it will do is stop the hurt in the communities in which they live, the school districts in their community who are hurting so hard to pay teachers, the fire districts who in some communities are literally deciding right now if they lay off firefighters or to get rid of another truck. In a time when we have massive forest fires across the country, let alone our state, that's dangerous. So yeah, your assessment rate is going to stay the same, right where it is, low, some of the lowest in the country. But the services that are provided within your community, if we don't um, pass Amendment B, they can be directly impacted and impact your way of life. With about a minute and a half before our closing statements, also a quick question that uh, Eric asked in the last debate. Uh, are there? It's early in the election season. I get that part, but are there any key endorsements that either has either side has uh, received so far? Dana, Dana. Sure. Sure. You know I. I keep pulling the list because there's so many, but um, specifically the Denver Post came out, their editorial board came out in support, um, business groups, Action 22, Club 20, Progressive 15, not normally always on the same side of things, all came out in agreement with this, um, the Colorado Association of School Boards, uh, the Rural Schools Alliance, um, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, because again, the non-residential uh, piece of this is farmers, is oil and gas, is commercial, is small businesses, NFIBs out in support of it. The whole gamut is coming together to say this, this needs to go. Michael, what about your side? Yeah, so I think there's two interesting ones to me. One is this is maybe the first time that uh, the, the Aurora Sentinel, uh, so Dave, Dave Perry and them, and, and, and I agree, they came out against it. Uh, but also the, the Colorado Communities, Inc. Is, is very concerned about what this would mean, and I think that's a big deal given that they deal with, with counties all the time. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, elections are about can you convince the people or not? And that is the, the ultimate thing. Talking, have this conversation directly with the people is most important. Well, it is now time for our closing statements. We offer each of our representatives 30 seconds. A coin flip before the program determined that Michael would go first. So, Michael, your 30-second closing statement. Sure. I think everybody knows uh, that their property taxes continue to go up every year. And uh, if this repeal is implemented, you will pay more in property taxes uh, than if it is not. And so I think the uncertainty that legislators, legislators are asking you to trust them with what comes next without any really clear plan on it. Um, and I think there is a legitimate problem that needs to get fixed. And I hope if this ends up losing that we get to work on that. And so I would encourage you uh, in November here to, to vote no on uh, Amendment B. And Danae, your 30-second closing statement. Sure. You know, today we talked about uh, the Gallagher Amendment, and it's a 40-year-old formula that's trapped within our state constitution. And it's a formula that's broken. It's a formula that has proven to be hurting Colorado. Amendment B repeals Gallagher, and it freezes property tax rates where they are today. Those rates can only go up by a vote of the people. That's not what this amendment does. It freezes things where they are. We don't need any more tax increases for small businesses. We don't need any more cuts to our schools or our firefighters or no more unfair formulas that actually penalize rural Colorado. B for teachers, B for firefighters, vote yes on Amendment B. Well, that is indeed all the time we have for our debate about the proposed repeal of the Gallagher Amendment. I'd like to thank our issue representatives, Representative Dinea Escar and Michael Fields. 
I also thank my fellow panelists, John Frank and Eric Sonderman. If you would like to find out more information about this or any of this year's general election issues or races, please visit our websites at pbs12.org, cbsdenver.com, and coloradosun.com. Next week, two more very important debates. At 7 p.m., we'll host a debate about the proposed 22-week abortion ban. And at 7.30, we'll take a look at the paid family leave proposal. And again, this is part of a great campaign that we're able to do because of you. We're very excited to be working with our partners at CBS4 and the Colorado Sun because all of this is about providing the most in-depth election coverage in Colorado. Uh, we hear a lot of the things on 30-second ads on uh, the commercial stations, a benefit of being on public television. You will not see those ads here. Uh, but we see a lot from the candidate races back and forth. But we don't hear enough about the ballot issues. That is solved right here because of the Colorado Decides partnership. And you have helped make that possible. So please feel free to go to our websites to watch any of our past debates. This was just one half of our big uh, fiscal issue uh, bonanza that we had tonight. Uh, last week, we tackled the wolf reintroduction issue and the national popular vote, and we'll continue to tackle big important issues and races throughout the election season every Friday on PBS 12 at 7 and 7.30, and of course, the websites and great reporting from our friends at CBS 4 and John Frank and all his colleagues at the Colorado Sun. For everybody here at PBS 12, the entire Colorado Decides Partnership, I'm Dominic Dizzuti.